Good morning. Good morning. So nice to see each and every one of you there. I had a surprise here for me. Um, this hat had a note on it that said it was part of my um, pastor's appreciation gift. So thank you so much for this. And it says on it, pastor, warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. So be careful. It may just happen. So I'm just going to wear it for, for this opening and then, uh, but not during the sermon. Um, good morning. And anybody online yet, Paul? Not yet. Okay. So we do do the live stream. We are looking into um, a new way of being able to include music in our live stream, still uh, gathering information on, on that program and see if we can incorporate that here for us. And um, it's a program that is some, uh, supposed to be easier than the whole computer system thing. So we're working on that. And uh, we do want to utilize the live stream it, it, for the sake of some of you have uh, uh, tuned in live stream when you couldn't come to service. And uh, we want to see if we can't incorporate people that would maybe not come to the church service, but still be a part of our service and, and hear the message. And uh, we'll see if we can't... Um, uh, move in that direction and get more people involved with our service here. So um, today for the invocation, I've chosen Galatians 5.1, and it says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And when I came across this verse this week, um, it kind of is going to go a little bit with what I, I'm going to talk in the sermon. But Christ set us free. And I've never been in prison. I could only imagine what it would be like being confined and restricted in every area of life. And sin has done that to us until Jesus said, you're forgiven. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in our message today. So uh, let's think about that. And, and, and as we do, don't allow ourselves to get overrun or overwhelmed or burdened by those things that can cause us to lose sight of that freedom we have in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for our time here together, this church family, and uh, our, our, our opportunity today to lift you up and praise you, to sing to you and sing for you and about you, to fellowship and talk and, and enjoy each other's company. That's what you want from us. And we want to lift you up in all that we do and say today. I pray your anointing on the message later and that uh, we could say it was good to be in the house of the Lord today when we leave. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Colleen is coming to do announcements and our call to worship. Good morning. Um, there's a lot of announcements today, so bear with us a little bit. Um, Tuesday morning Bible study, 10 a.m. to 11.30. Um, the Bible study is on the book of Romans. It's open to all via Zoom. Um, the monthly church meeting is a week earlier due to Thanksgiving. So it's Wednesday, November 20th. Um, also, all are welcome, and it's uh, via Zoom, and the information is in your bulletin. Um, next week is the craft fair, um, which many of you will be there and not here. Um, and um, it's, the, it's from... 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., and uh, those of who are here will go over afterwards, I hope. I know I will, so we'll see you guys all there. Um, you're invited to a Thanksgiving Eve service at New Hope in Millville, Mass. It's at uh, 6 p.m., and they're having a pie social afterwards, so feel free to bring one if you can, and if you have any questions, see Pastor Joe. 
Um, there is going to be a short meeting after church today regarding the Thanksgiving shut-ins and the food list for that, correct? Any other information on that? Jackie, okay. Um, oh, I know, I forgot something. These containers will be in the back room. If anybody would like to take some, we're gonna try to make some meals for Beth. And this is a great size. Also, Sheila said we'll be getting bigger ones also. Um, the neat thing about this, if you make dinner and you like, you have a lot left over, what a great thing to do. Put it in, write, write what it is, and you can put them, bring them to church, put them in the freezer. Anything like that is gonna be so helpful to her. Plus, she, Beth would love to know that, oh, someone made a shepherd's pie. Look at this is from someone, you know, I think you would love that, right, Beth? Some nice home-cooked meals. Say yes. <laughs> so if you have any questions, see Sheila. But she, Sheila said she could also deliver them. So it's really easy for us. Um, it's not even extra work if we do leftovers and take some of those. I love that idea. Um, also, oh, I wrote it down somewhere. Here it is. Um, December 7th is, uh, I guess, an annual, this is something I didn't know about, an annual Christmas party potluck ornament swap. Um, you buy an ornament from 10 to 15 bucks, or if you find one cheaper that's nice, that's okay. Um, and it, we wanna know who's attending so as to know where, where we will have it. Um, so, and if you could see Julie to let her know if you can attend, that's December 7th, um, then we can kind of work out the details on that. And I just saw this one too, a Never Forgotten Christmas concert. December 7th, 7.30 p.m. in Millbury. Um, see Bunny or Lynn, doors open at 6.30. Are those the guys that came here last year, never forgotten? Okay, so I know those guys, they're good guys. All right, so um, for the call to worship today, I was, I had something in mind, but I woke up this morning with a song on my heart, so I'd like to share that song as a call to worship, if that's okay. And it's an oldie, you might know it. You might not, because it's so old. You said you'd come and share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away. But just like you promised, you came there to stay. I just had to pray. Feel free to sing it with me if you know it. And Jesus said, come to the waters and stand by my side. I know you are thirsty. You won't be denied. And I felt every teardrop. When in darkness you cried, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Your goodness so great, I can understand, but dear Lord, I know that all was planned. I know you're here now and always will be. Your love loosed my chains and in you I am free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, come to the world and stand by my side. I know you are thirsty. You won't be denied. And I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. 
And I just want to say thank you for um, pastor appreciation and um, the shirt that I got and now the hat. I am going to uh, wear that often. Um, just by way of announcement, uh, it didn't make it in the bulletin, but I am going to visit family the weekend after Thanksgiving back in Pennsylvania and uh, going to my class reunion, which is a very long time ago. And uh, so I'm gonna visit family while I'm, I'm back in Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. And um, so Pastor Gill has um, accepted the invitation to come and, and share the, that Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, so our associate pastor, Mark, will be uh, leading the service. Pastor Gill will be sharing. So we can look forward to that. Uh, by way of praise, uh, Jackie has uh, said, praise God for his providence and healing and his healing power. Thank you, Father, that you listen and answer prayers. How many of us are thankful for that? Yeah, Lord, here am I. So we all can agree with that. Um, no update. We prayed for Bruce the last couple of weeks. He has an aneurysm on his heart. He had surgery this past week. No update on that, but we want to remember him and, um, and, and his prayer there. Uh, Mary didn't write this out, but we prayed for a young man who has uh, something on his brain. Did, is there any update on that, Mary? And what is his name? Zach. Zachary. So just to uh, highlight, if you didn't hear, Mary, uh, Zachary has a, a growth in his brain from birth, and uh, he has seizures because of that. So we want to remember Zachary. And um, I, know, I know we do the cards by way of the flow of the service, but we all have a prayer request. We all have those needs in our lives, the, the, the need for comfort, the need for help in transition, and the need for um, finances. And uh, my brother Bill, I have no update on him. We've been praying for him. Uh, he has um, been undergoing radiation. So I'm under the impression that old saying, no news is good news. So, but we, we prayed for Bill, um, my friend Tim, also radiation for colon cancer and, and chemotherapy. Um, Michelle, we prayed for Michelle, my friend, and uh, she's doing great. I've seen her the last couple of weeks. She's a nurse, and um, so she said it's hard to be on the receiving end of care, and I know how that is, but uh, she's doing great, and that's part of God's answering prayers. And so uh, as we take time to pray, and praise God for the good things in our lives. We know that we serve a God who answers prayers. And he's on our side to help us through every situation we go through. So let's take the time right now to just for one moment, think about the good things in our lives. Let's close our eyes. And just for a moment, just thank the Lord for those things in our own little way. Just, just express a thank you. Lord, thank you for the shelter. Thank you for the food that we have. Thank you for clothing. Thank you for your presence that you're in our lives. Thank you for so many good things, Lord. Thank you for the answered prayers. Thank you for your divine providence in our lives that there's no coincidence, that you are in total control and that you are going to see us through every situation, every circumstance, no matter what it is, because you love us, you care for us, you have compassion for us. So Father, today we just lift up these uh, praise and prayers to you. Thank you, Lord, uh, that we know you, your word says that you can hear our prayers. And as we lift them up, the Bible says that they are like a sweet smelling incense to you. Lord, we pray today in thanksgiving thanking you for the good things in our lives and also, Lord, for the prayers that we have, the, uh, the needs and the petitions that we bring before you. We want to thank you for Michelle feeling better. Thank you for David Jr. and his recovery from this tragic accident. Barbara recovering from her chemotherapy and the effects of that. Thank you, Lord, for the good things. 
And uh, so, Lord, we bring before you Bruce again. Bruce that uh, had the surgery this week, we don't know the outcome, but we're praying that he would recover from it and that your healing hand would touch him in a way that he would sense it from you and that you, Lord, you would open up the eyes of his heart that he may see you. And if he doesn't know you, that he would turn to you. Lord, we also want to remember as uh, th this young man, Zachary, 15 years old, having constant seizures because of this growth in his brain. Lord, we pray that you would reduce that growth. And if it's by your will that he's operated on, that you would uh, work through that operation, that he would recover from it, and that through Mary, he might come to know your love and your grace and your forgiveness. And Lord, there's a, a prayer card that I failed to remember here for Cheryl this morning, our sister Cheryl, who, who isn't here among us, but we pray for her as she has uh, uh, expressed the need for help as her mom is very sick and her brother has been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray that you would intervene and that you would heal. Bring healing, Lord, where healing is needed. And for those of us here today, bring comfort where comfort is needed, Lord. Would you bring strength where strength is needed? Would you help us, Lord, to recognize that you are in complete and total control? Lord, we want to thank you. And uh, we, we pray, Lord, for our country. And after this election, Lord, whether it was our candidate that got elected or not, we know that you are in, in total, you are still in co total control and that you are working out your will. And as we as a nation uh, of people who pray, we pray that your will would be done in our nation. And help us, Lord, to pray as we pray for our community. We want to see people from Blackstone, Millville, the surrounding areas, Woonsocket, where people would be touched by your Holy Spirit and be drawn to this place similarly in the way that the animals were drawn to the ark. Would you draw people here to hear the message of love and grace and mercy from you and from your word? And so, Father, as we pray for these things, we, we remember the prayer that you taught your disciples as we shared together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Sunday school. So we'll let the kids go to Sunday school. Four weeks ago, me and Colleen, were wa we were watching a football game. And during the game, Colleen commented, she said, boy, these commentators sure are for this one team. They favored them. You could tell the way that they were talking about the team they were making and the, the excitement or, or the way that they were describing the team that they liked over the other team. The players for the team they liked, they were talking them up and how good and this and that and then the team that they weren't favoring so much, oh yeah, he made that play kind of thing. And this goes along the lines of something called being biased. And it means that it just clearly that you favor something or someone or maybe a group. Uh, in politics um, is another area where biases are clearly seen, favoring one group over another. One more example. We live in New England, and um, I favor the New England sports teams over other sports teams. It's something that I am biased towards the New England teams. I like them more 
well, not so much lately, but I do like them more, or I have bias towards them. So let me ask you this question. Do you have any biases? Is there anyone or anything in your life that you favor over other things? Maybe sports teams or family member, a uh, group of people. So just we're going to talk a little bit about that today as we've been looking at the life of Jonah the last couple of weeks. And uh, there's many things that can be learned from these four chapters of the story of the life of Jonah. But the one main theme that stands out we've been talking about is God's mercy. And so the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, God's mercy in chapter one, seen as it is undeserving, undeserved. And then in chapter two, we see how God's mercy is seen as unexpected. And we're going to continue on and finish up this life of Jonah and look at uh, mercy uh, as, as it is described in Jonah's life. As we look at chapter three and four, in chapter three, God's mercy is seen as unbiased. And then in chapter four, in chapter three, it's unbiased. In chapter four, God's mercy is seen as unlimited. So let me just pause there just to say, I forgot to say this earlier. Uh, also, uh, when Pastor Hugo comes to speak, it's the first Sunday in December, and uh, Jonathan Steele is going to be coming to lead worship on the uh, organ for us too. So it's going to be a special day, and uh, I'll miss it, but I'll get to view it on the live stream that we do, so I'll be able to watch it whenever I can uh, get to it. So if you do have a Bible and you'd like to turn to John, uh, Jonah, and it is towards the, it is in the Old Testament, towards the New Testament. So if you go to the middle of the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, and go backwards, you'll find it there. So if you want, if you don't have your Bible and you want to use one from the pew there, you're welcome to do that. Um, and so we're looking at today, chapter three of uh, Jonah's story, and, and it's about Jonah going to Nineveh and preaching. Now, we know that from chapter one and two, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, so he goes the opposite direction. He gets thrown off of a ship, a big fish swallows him up, and then three days later, the fish is vom vomits Jonah out. And that's where we're at now. But Jonah is vomited out on, on, on dry land. And here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, say this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began, to go, uh, began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So uh, Jonah is sent here, and this time he finally obeys the word of the Lord. He finally says, I will do what you want me to do, Lord. And he goes and he preaches this message. Now the message was plain, and it was a short message. It was a clear message, and it was an anointed message. And I'm just going to stop here from my notes just to say, if you're ever prompted to say something, don't hold that back because maybe from God and he is going to anoint what it is that you say. I had a, a very good talk this week with my neighbor. She had some real concerns about the new newly elected president. And as we were talking, I just felt the need to share the gospel with her. And I did plainly about Jesus dying on the cross for her sins. And she had some things to say, and, and um, as we share about witnessing and talking about this in messages to come next year, and, and it's not for us to save people or to see them converted right then, even though that may happen. And she had uh, some 
kind of things to say like, oh, there's a thousand gods that have been documented over the years and you just think yours is the only one. Yeah, I do think that. <laughs> That's why I'm telling you that you need to believe him. But just, uh, so Jonah's message was anointed, and it was a powerful message. Now, according to what was written in the Bible here, it's only eight words. And I know you're going to look and count them right now, so I'll count them with you. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Okay, so eight, eight, just only eight words. So some of you might be thinking, Pastor, you do well to learn from Jonah and make your messages just short and sweet. We're, we're working on that. Here is what I want to say. Now, I'm sure Jonah loved preaching this message, and here's why. It was a message of judgment. Did you hear? 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Nothing in here about God's love, not God's compassion. Or, this was Jonah's message to them. Now, Jonah was probably thinking, you're finally going to get what you deserve. You Syrians, the way you've treated us Israelites over the years. 40 days, and you're going to be history. Hey. That's kind of what I'm thinking Jonah was thinking. Remember, he didn't want to go and do this. Now, verses 6 through 9, uh, and 6 through 10 tells us that the message was received. And when it got to the king, the king even declared a, a nationwide fast in the hopes that God would relent and not bring this judgment to them. And so, verse 8, let, uh, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And verse 10 is the answer to that, uh, to their decision to turn for what they're doing in humbling themselves. Remember, 2 Chronicles, I don't have it written in my notes, 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is one of those verses that you would do well to memorize. Write it down, put it up on your mirror so that you can see it every day. If my people who are called by my name, who humble themselves, turn from the evil ways, I will then hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. And so, this is a, a, a verse that would do well for us to remember. And here is what happened to Nineveh. They turned from their evil ways. They turned to God and asked for God's forgiveness. And he relented. In verse 10, did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And so here we see the third expression of God's mercy is, it is unbiased. God doesn't show favoritism. To be biased means to have or show an unfair tendency to believe that some people or ideas or groups are better than others. And so here we see that God was not holding a grudge toward the Ninevites. Nor was he biased toward them regarding their evil ways. He didn't see them in any unfavorable way. He repented. He turned from their evil ways. And they looked to God for forgiveness. And he reveals his character and his attributes of love and grace and compassion, kindness, forgiveness even to these evil Ninevites. We learn from the Bible that God does not show favoritism toward any person or group, nor is he a respecter of persons. Let me share a couple of verses that talk about this. Romans 2.11, For there is no respect of persons with God. That's as plain as it gets. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ. Acts 10, 34, 35, and 36. And Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. 
accepts every accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. In 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, that all should reach repentance. So one other thing that I want to point out here is this display of God's, this is a display of God's justice. He is a God of love and patience, compassion, forgiveness, but he's also a God of justice. As God is loving, compassionate, kind, patient in all of his attributes and his character, he is also a just God. Justice is where actions are taken into account and they are rewarded or punished. Good actions are rewarded, bad actions are punished. We all are bad people in God's sight because of sin. God made a way for his justice to be expressed to all mankind through the life and death of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty for all mankind's wrongdoings. Jesus hung on the cross. He was beaten, bleeding, in pain and agony. And the ultimate punishment is seen when Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God turned his face away from Jesus so that he would never turn his face away from you or me. Now, there's an example of this in this little story of a courtroom. You might have heard this. Bear with me if you have. It goes like this. The devil is the prosecuting attorney. Jesus is the defense attorney. God is the judge. You are on trial. The devil brings his charges against you. They're pretty convincing. How bad? How wrong? How many? How true they all are. It doesn't look good for you. The devil's right. He has a strong case against you. God turns to Jesus, your defense attorney, and says, Do you have anything to say against these accusations? Jesus says, Yes. As a matter of fact, I do. They are all true. He or she has done them all. Very bad. Very wrong. Despicable. In some ways, unbelievable. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, you're supposed to be my defense attorney. You're supposed to be on my side. And God the judge says, and they deserve punishment. And Jesus says, yes, they do. And God the judge says, have anything else you would like to present on their behalf? And Jesus says, yes, there is. As much as they deserve the punishment you have determined for all their actions, I would like to present to you my death on the cross as atonement for all their wrongdoings and actions. I would like to present to you on behalf of my client my sacrifice, my death in exchange for their punishment. God says, acquitted, restored, set them free, never to be tried for these wrongdoings again. See, God's justice was put on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, so we would never have to face it. That is, being, that is what it means to be saved, to be redeemed, to be set free and to have victory. So moving on to the fourth chapter is quite interesting because it's a look at Jonah's actions or reactions and his attitude. Here we see Jonah actually being mad. 
how God's mercy on the Ninevites. In chapter 4, it says, But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and bounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Now, as I read through that, can you hear Jonah? And can you kind of hear those of us who had children the way our Kids talk sometimes. Wah, wah. Really? Why can't I have that? They have that. Do you hear that in, his, in the way he's talking? Here we see Jonah's attitude, and it was not pleasant. Yet he actually prays, reciting God's wonderful attributes. But to Jonah, God's only supposed to be that way to him. And to the Israelites, not for other people, not for these heathen people, just for us. He's so angry, he says, I'd rather die than to think of these evil people being treated with your mercy. God asks Jonah, do you have a right to be mad? Have you ever been so mad that you say something or do something that you kind of wish you never did? Don't ask my wife. Jeez. There might have been a time or two that I've expressed something that I shouldn't have. And here, it's almost like, I think Jonah is almost doing that, even though, in some ways, he's so mad, it's eating him up. Ever get that way? No, you might not have. I, I might have had a time or two in my life where that seems to be the case. Now, Jonah doesn't answer God. God says, do you have a right to be mad? And Jonah, what's interesting, he doesn't answer God. He goes out and makes a shelter and watches to see what will happen. And the impression is that he is waiting for God's judgment and destruction of the city and its people. He may be thinking he's going to see fire come down from heaven like it did over Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's, even though he prays, I know that you're a God of compassion and kindness and patience and relent for those that might repent. He's still thinking that judgment's coming. God's judgment is true and it's right and it's necessary for these Ninevites. And so he's, he makes a shelter for himself, a shield from the, the hot sun. And God causes a leafy plant to grow over Jonah, to give him shade from the hot sun. And Jonah likes it. Don't you like it when things go our way? Things are good. Things are swell. All is well. What did he say in the mornings? Um, good morning, neighbor. It's a good in the neighborhood. So that's how we feel when things are going our way. So the leafy plant grows over Jonah, the hot sun, he's got the shade from the hot sun, and all is well. Thank you, Lord, for this plant to give me shade. Now, bring down the fire on Nineveh. It's kind of what he's thinking. Here's what happens. The next day, God causes a worm to eat the plant and it dies, causing the sun to be down on Jonah, and Jonah gets mad again. Talk about a roller coaster. He's happy, he's mad, he's running away, he gets called back, he finally says he'll do what God wants him to do, he's obedient, and he's so mad, he wants to die because God's going to relent and not bring punishment to these people. Verse 8, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant now? So he's mad about the Ninevites getting forgiveness, and now he's mad that God took away this plant. Jonah is quite the extremist. Now, 
my wife might have said that about me once or twice, but it just happens where you get so involved and it's eating you up. And that's what I see here in Jonah. He's just so intense about this. He's so angry that he says he wishes that he would die two times to God. He's saying, I'd rather die than to see you show mercy to the people that I think don't deserve it. And it's interesting that God didn't grant him his wish. Oh, you want to die? Okay. Ed. But he didn't. Again, another sign of God's mercy. But listen to God's reply in verse 10 of chapter 4. The Lord said to Jonah, You have been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. So he's saying how this really made him feel good and happy, and it was a good thing for him. But he says, but You're angry that it died and you don't have it as shade anymore. It's a good thing in your life. And he says this, in verse 11, And should not I, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So, there are some commentators and theologians that say the idea of this passage in the way that it was written tends and leans toward children of Nineveh. So if we put it in that context, God is saying to Jonah, there's 120,000 kids in that city. Shouldn't I be compassionate for them? Shouldn't I be concerned for them and also for their animals? And Jonah, you are so grateful for this plant, which is temporary, but I'm concerned about the eternal outcome for all people. God is saying to Jonah, mercy is mine to extend. To whomever I wish. God didn't smite Jonah's wish to die. He extended his mercy to him. In his anger and arrogance toward God, God still had mercy on Jonah. And he is that way to all of us. So the fourth expression of God's mercy is this. It's unlimited. To the Ninevites who didn't deserve it, according to Jonah, yet God extends it to them. And he is still doing the same thing each of us today, extending his mercy to every single person. We just have to accept it from him. And because of our experience with it, God is asking us to share that mercy to those that have not experienced it. That's what I was doing with my neighbor. And I was telling her that Jesus died on the cross for her sins. I was basically saying, God is extending his mercy toward you. And he did it through Jesus. The mercy of God can come in many forms, as we see that Jonah got swallowed up by a big fish and then vomited out afterwards, and he still survived it. It comes in different forms and in different ways. So in closing, I'd like, I've, I've asked, Paul, do you have this song prepared? That one that we, we can you get that song that we had that first week? Can, can, I just want us to hear that song again about the mercy of God and how it's extended to us. And I would like us to think about the words, whether you close your eyes during the song or you follow the words on the screen, I'd like you to just think about the mercy of God in your life and ask God how you can be an example, whether verbally or in your actions, of God's mercy. And the King James Version says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
How many of you are thankful for that today and his mercy that follows us each and every day? Uh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of us until we meet together again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.